Um, that's all for the announcements. It just leaves me uh, the great pleasure to introduce Professor Yap uh, Kulhas, who is a professor uh, or um, has spent his academic career uh, culminating in being the Dean of the Education uh, Committee at University of Gronig. Jab's career has been characterized by his more out-of-the-box style thinking, um, that's, and he was one of the earliest advocates of studying individual differences in animal behavior, specifically using ethologically valid tasks to investigate uh, mechanisms underlying social behavior and stress, and particularly how animals cope in those stressful conditions. Uh, specifically, Jab will be talking about his um, great interest in aggression and stress with aggression as well. Uh, Yap has an H index of 55, over 9,000 citations from 230 different publications. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce him here and to have him as the closing keynote speaker. He'll help me welcome. Thank you, Jared, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank the uh, um, organizing committee for inviting me. I, I feel truly honored, but also somewhat nervous because of the expectations this has generated. Um, I, I decided to um, dedicate this uh, lecture to Bob and Caroline Blanchard, which I, I really regret that they couldn't make it to come to this, this meeting. But um, their approach to, to science, their views, their knowledge, but in particular their enthusiasm, has inspired me throughout my academic career. So uh, I would like to acknowledge them for, for this, uh, uh, this great uh, contribution. Um, I put this slide up on purpose because these faces, they express the really kind, uh, uh, empathetic kind of uh, uh, people. And it's a big contrast to uh, these two faces I've never seen Bob and Caroline this, this angry, and I don't think they, they have the capacity to become this angry. But it, it emphasized the point that aggressive behavior should be considered as, um, as a form of social communication. I think everyone really understands these two faces. Uh, don't, don't approach them. Um, uh, <laughs> I would never trust uh, approaching these people because they can explode, basically. Um, and this is throughout the animal kingdom. Um, I think, uh, well, human beings, uh, but a baboon will not approach this one. It's, uh, uh, it's again, highly dangerous. It signals um, his, his anger, basically. It's um, a big contribution of Bob and Caroline that um, they demonstrated that aggressive behavior is bound to certain rules. It, they, you have to play the game according to certain rules, and I would like to show that with a little video clip um, of aggressive behavior, a, a dominance fight in, uh, in rats. This is as fast as it goes, and um, in a moment it'll slow down by a factor 10, and you can show what really happens. You can see that animals try to, to get often at the back of the opponent. That's the only place where you're allowed to bite. The skin is rather thick and um, you don't get uh, severe woundings. Um, and animals are all the time trying to, to get to the back of the, of the other one. But at a certain moment, this animal now uh, shows uh, lateral kind of threatening behavior. It's again a signaling kind of behavior. And at a certain moment, this one gets at the back of the other one, uh, bites, and kicks with its hind legs. And finally, the one, the animal that loses the fight, gets on its back. And whereas the dominant can have plenty of opportunity to bite here, it doesn't do so. So aggressive behavior is bound to all sorts of rules. Its function is to obtain, it's not to damage, to cause damage to another one. Its function is to obtain and protect resources. 
And its characteristics are social communication between conflict partners, and it's a strong inhibitory control mechanism for the potentially uh, dangerous and negative aspects of aggression. It's bound to very strong uh, negative inhibitory control. Um, and this inhibitory control is, well, olfactory, auditory, visual communication, of course, of dominant and subordinate relationship. These animals know each other. They don't need uh, to show overt fighting all the time. It's ritualization of aggressive uh, elements, redirection of aggressive behavior, taboos. You're not allowed to bite anywhere else but in the back of the, of the opponent. And once there has been a fight, you have all sorts of appeasement, reconciliation behavior, and so on. And this uh, leads to, I think we, we need some definitions. So in my view, the definition of aggressive behavior is a social communication aimed at the active control of resources and the social environment. And it's characterized by strong inhibitory control mechanisms and context specificity. You don't fight outside your territory. You fight in a specific context. And this definition then leads to a definition of violence, which I consider as the pathology of aggression. And that definition is an escalated form of aggressive behavior that's expressed out of context and out of its inhibitory control. And that has lost its adaptive biological function in social communication. It leads to severe harm and damage also to vulnerable body parts. So I make this clear distinction between aggression as a biological functional form of behavior, we can't do without that, and violence as this pathological form. So then the question is, what causes this shift from aggressive behavior towards its pathology, violence in this case? Well, I, I also learned from the Blanchard that you really have to understand your behavior thoroughly to, to uh, address, before you address all sorts of mechanistic kind of questions uh, like the neurobiology. So I would like to, to go a little bit in, in more detail about this behavior. Everyone who works with social behavior and maybe any kind of behavior knows that there is a strong individual variation in, in aggressive behavior. From early studies, we, we know um, if you study this in, in the field, in the fetal populations of mice, we know that this kind of individual variation in behavior has a clear function in the biology and the ecology of the species. So we're dealing with a variation in aggressive behavior that has its function in survival, reproduction, and dispersal of the species. And, of, and then, of course, if that has the function, it has fitness consequence in evolutionary terms and contributes to the gene pool of the population. Now, of course, this individual variation aggression is based on an individual variation in its underlying physiology. I would like to go a little bit more detail in this individual variation, and I show a few examples of uh, what the function is in, in, uh, in a natural kind of population. Well, if, if that's the function in the field of a wild population, then the first question is, what is my laboratory animal? How does my laboratory strain relate to uh, the, its original wild ancestors? And because we couldn't find an answer to that, it's virtually unknown. We decided uh, many years ago to change our research to wild-type rats. These animals were originally caught in the, in the wild, brought into the laboratory, and we're breeding them now in a certain way in, in our own laboratory. So they're semi-wild feral rats, wild-type rats. The, the significance of this choice uh, I will show in the next slide. If, if you measure the individual variation in aggressive behavior, so the frequency distribution of offensive aggressive behavior, the tendency of individuals to defend its home territory against an intruder male, 
then there is a pretty large population of animals that do not attack at all. Uh, there's an intermediate group, and there's a highly aggressive group that goes up to 80, 90 percent of the observation time being uh, offensive, aggressive. If you compare this with one of the standard laboratory rats, the, the, the Wista strain, then it's clear that this highly offensive phenotype is completely absent in this population, which means that, well, first of all, um, your studies using laboratory strains suffer from a very strong selection bias. And of course, if you, if you are interested in aggressive behavior in the laboratory strain, the most interesting phenotype is completely absent. So we, the, the results I'm going to show you are the results obtained from this uh, strain of wild type, originally wild animals. Well, it, it was in the, in the 70s it was Jim Henry who suggested that the variation in aggressive behavior is related to more generally the way you deal with environmental challenges. And he explained it at that time that the uh, aggressive phenotype uh, performed the cannon fight flight response. And there's already fight in it, there's aggression in it. Uh, we now call this proactive coping, and I'll, I'll explain later on why we call it like that. The non-aggressive animal was considered to perform the conservation withdrawal uh, syndrome, uh, originally defined by uh, Engel and Schmeel. Well, Henry, in his first publications, said this is depression. And we had long discussions with Jim Henry and say, well, you're wrong. It's just doing nothing in certain kind of conditions. It might be just as good an alternative for being very active. And so it's, it's not a disease. It's just an alternative way of, of solving a problem. And he finally agreed with that and said, yes, I am too much an American. Uh, <laughs> I have to be active, uh, proactive, and, and doing nothing is not in my culture. All right. Um, we now call this reactive coping, and we consider it as two alternative ways to deal with the social environment. But this, this predicts that the way you deal with your social environment um, has that something to do with you, the way you deal with any kind of problem. It, it it's, it's, uh, goes across a context. The experiment I would like to show you is this one. The problem we face the animal with is this little probe here, which is electrified. Uh, it's a novel object, basically, and the animal will explore it. And of course, it gets in touch with the electricity and doesn't like it. Um, and a non-aggressive male that doesn't attack an intruder in his home territory um, just hides in the corner and uh, never touches the, the, the probe again. It's a highly perfect solution to this problem. Uh, I have a little video clip um, showing what an aggressive male is doing in this kind of situation. The, I don't need to explain it. The animal will explain it himself. It will be obvious. So it, it gives me some time to take a drink of water. You see what the animal is doing. It, it's burying the damn thing under the <laughs> wood shavings. And I call this an active way of, of dealing with this particular problem. It, it's, also, it's also proactive because if you give the probe one week later without any electricity, it's the aggressive male that immediately starts burying um, uh, this probe as if it was electrified. 
Well, you, you, you can play this. Well, okay, let's, let's get at some data. So there is indeed a, a highly significant positive correlation between aggressive behavior in a home territory and this time burying. An animal that spends around 80, 90% of its time burying behavior will spend uh, about 70, 80% time as burying behavior. Well, the, the non-aggressive male shows immobility. It just sits in the corner and, and it's fine. Now, this, this defensive burying test has widely, been widely used as a test for anxiety. And of course, it elicits anxiety, but um, anxiety doesn't explain the differential response pattern in this, uh, this paradigm. Because if you take another um, uh, measure of anxiety, there is no relationship whatsoever with attack latency or with offensive aggression in this case. So what the test basically is doing, it allows the animal two different kind of solutions to an anxiety eliciting stimulus. It's a coping style test, basically. Well, you, you can play this game uh, many times. If, if you put an aggressive male in, in a cold environment and you give it some uh, stuff to, to build a nest, it's the aggressive male that starts building a nest. It's a non-aggressive male that just shivers in the corner of the cage. Um, if, if you test them, oh, hang on, it's uh, uh, just, just if you test them in the four swim test, well known, well, I heard it several times at this meeting, it's measuring depression. It's, it's nonsense. It's measuring, it's measuring coping style. It's a non-aggressive male that shows his immobility behavior. It's the aggressive male that shows the, um, uh, the, the escape uh, kind of behavior. So in my view, we are dealing with two kinds of dimensions. And one is what I would call a coping style dimension, which is um, a, a qualitative dimension. How do you react? What type of reaction do you show? And the other one is an, uh, more a quantitative dimension. How strongly do you react? An emotionality dimension. And so the aggressive males are on this side and the non-aggressive males are on this side. And these are individual characteristics that are expressed in a wide variety of contexts. All right. Um, I, I have to go to one other important behavioral difference that, in my view, explains why some of these animals go into violent kind of behavior. And that relates to behavioral flexibility. What I will show you is a teammate's experiment, which is based on, originally on, Similar kind of experiments we've done in rats and mice, but um, the, the one that show best are experiments in, in, uh, in pigs, done by Lisbeth Bolhuis of the Agricultural University in Wageningen, um, and it, it shows itself. It's a teammate's experiment in pigs. It has to start, yeah. This is the... Uh, they're well-trained. They, they like it. There's no difference between aggressive and non-aggressive pigs. So they start here and they get their food over there. That's fine. <laughs> and they all learn it uh, perfectly well. Now you, you can use this to, to look how they react to some changes in, in this maze paradigm. And the first one they're doing is put a bucket over here. It, it derived from similar experiments in rats and mice where you just simply put a piece of tape on the floor. Well, if, if you take a proactive pig, it notices that there is something on the floor over there, and it just goes on. It hardly pays attention to this minor change in the environment. We'll compare this to what a reactive animal is doing, a non-aggressive pig. You see that, that the behavior of this animal is heavily guided by this small change in the environment. <laughs> so
So finally it gets there. No, no problem, it's safe. Okay, if, if I formulate it in this way, that the main difference is the degree in which behavior depends on environmental input, environmental cues, then I'm basically saying that, that the, the proactive individual, the aggressive individual, forms routines. Doesn't pay attention to, to environment anymore. And the way to, to analyze that is that we change the rewarding side from the left arm to the right. Let's see what a proactive animal is doing. Doesn't, he finds no food over there. <laughs> you, you, you never know, it may help. <laughs> You see that this animal has great troubles from changing from a once learned task to a new one. And that's, in my view, because proactivity means that you behave on the basis of predictions. You predict that it's over there and you behave accordingly. Well, finally, it, it finds its reward. All right, uh, no surprise what a non-aggressive reactive coping pig is doing. There you go. <laughs> well, I, I have to say uh, this is a, a perfect example of good video editing. But, but you have to take my words that you can really quantify this really nicely. And uh, as I said, it's been replicated in, uh, in, in rats and mice. Um, and it, it's been replicated in a different kind of paradigm we use recently. Um, and this is an operant conditioning paradigm where animals have to bar press to obtain food, it's delivered with a, a food dispenser. And you can use a variety of schedules to test in more detail aspects of behavioral flexibility and impulsivity. Now the example I'm going to, to show you is how they perform on a variable interval. A variable interval 15, which means that on average these animals get a, a food reward, a food pellet, after 15 seconds uh, after it has pressed the lever. Um, but it may be one second or it may be 30 seconds. Um, that's completely random. So it's a somewhat unpredictable environment. Well, Again, that performance in this variable interval is, again, significantly correlated with offensive behavior in the territory. So here now we have a relationship between the way you deal with your social environment and the way you deal with your food environment. What's actually happening is that this aggressive male, or so non-aggressive male, presses the bar and simply listens till the food pellet drops and eats it and then presses again. It's a one-to-one -one relationship with stimulus input and, and behavior, basically. What the aggressive male is doing, he starts hammering like mad on, on this lever until it has a whole pile of food and then eats it. Um, but it's highly inefficient what this animal is doing. So it's, it's a completely different kind of strategy. So. To summarize this, in my view, the basic difference is, is that the reactive coping animal has some kind of feedback control. It acts on the basis of sensory input, first things and then does. It's flexible and that's adequate in the variable environment. I didn't show that to you, but these non-aggressive males, they're doing much better under conditions of migration in an environment which you cannot really predict. It's the proactive animal that has a feed-forward control. It acts first on the base of predictions. It first does and then thinks. It's rigid. But in a stable environment, why would you bother about all the details if this environment is, is stable? So in a stable environment, this is highly efficient. And I would claim that these animals are violent prone. And I explain you why. Uh, 
But first, let, let me show this. This has formed the basis of what's currently called animal personality. These kind of differences are found in, in a wide variety of species, and I just included a few of them. Um, it, it's a lot of work done in trout at the moment, in sticklebacks, uh, pigs, as, uh, as I showed you. I'll show you one example of this uh, cute little bird. Uh, it's well known in, in Europe, and I think it's maybe all over the world, a great tit. Um, the people from the Ecological Institute um, did a smart experiment because these, these birds, they show this large individual variation in aggressive behavior as well, uh, which is related to, to coping style. What they did in, in, a, in the field, in the big woodland, they caught all the offspring from the nests in the spring. And they tested them for one day in the laboratory for their behavioral characteristics and then released them at the end of the day back in the field. And one year later, they studied survival. Okay. They did this for three years. There were two years where there was not a lot of food around. There was scarcity of food. And the slow here is indicated that's the reactive, non-aggressive individual. And under conditions of low food availability, it's the uh, non-aggressive, the reactive coping animal that's doing better in terms of survival uh, than the uh, proactive ones. And I guess these animals have a better knowledge of the environment to, fall, to find alternative food sources. It's the, in, in the one year there was a lot of food around, then it's the proactive coping animal that's doing much better. It's a more, let's say, a more stable kind of an environment. So basically we're dealing here with an, an, an example of what we call the match-mismatch hypothesis. Animals are being raised to survive in a certain kind of condition. If the environment meets that same uh, uh, personality, let's so to say, then they're doing fine. But if they end up in the wrong environment, let's say a proactive animal in a poor environment, they, they don't do that well. All right. I would like you to think of what, what happens with this kind of routine formation if that happens in a social environment. As I said, the, the, what this routine formation means that you gradually shut down on environmental input. You can show that in these kind of maze kind of conditions. But what would happen if you shut down on environmental in a social environment? You probably shut down on input from your opponent. Well, but then you have to develop these kind of routines. So the experiment we did is that we trained these animals, we gave these animals 10 times or 15 times winning experience. And then you get, well, of course, a non-aggressive male remains non-aggressive. You get a trained not aggressive, you get a trained high aggressive and you get a trained pathological aggression, uh, aggressive animal. And I'll show that to you. And I gradually build it up. Um, the, the best comparison is between the, the gray and the black one. The black one is, will be the violent individual. So the, the violent individual um, has a very, very short attack latency. Within a couple of seconds, they, they attack um, compared to the high aggressive, uh, let's say, normal animal. Um, there's not so much difference in the total amount of offensive behavior. They're both real aggressive, but the main difference is, is, is the context in which they show aggressive behavior. On a neutral cage, so outside the territory, a normal animal never, never attacks. This violent animal does attack. It attacks an anesthetized intruder, which is weird. Uh, it, it's, it's weird to see, actually. They attack their own female. They attack whatever they, they can. And the ratio between, let's say, threatening behavior, which is a form of, of social communication, uh, introductory aggressive behavior, and the... Um, clinch and attack 
is strongly reduced, which means that these violent animals, they immediately attack without any warning, uh, social signals that you are aggressive, they attack immediately. It's important to notice that this occurs in about 7% of the total population. And I would call this the pathology of aggression, it's violence, which occurs in this small percentage of the total population. Well, I would summarize this, uh, that the indices of violence is an exaggerated aggression, it's out of context, attacks females, elicitized males, it's out of control, a low threat attack ratio, uh, severe wounding of vulnerable body parts, and so on. Um, and the routine formation may lead to violence in about 7% of the male rat population. And the question now is, what are the behavioral characteristics of this, this violent phenotype? What is specific about this, this 7%? Well, in the view of the human data, uh, of course we address the question whether that's impulsivity. Well, again, in this operant condition paradigm, you can uh, test impulsivity. And the schedule we used was a delayed reinforcement schedule, which means that these animals have to press the lever uh, and they get their food pellet, but they have to wait for 60 seconds before they can get another food pellet. If they have a premature press, then another delay of 60 seconds starts. It's almost somewhat punished, basically. And you can the per, summarize the performance of these animals in these uh, intervals of, of lever pressing. You see this animal is doing pretty well. This is the 60-second uh, boundary. Um, and, and on average, this animal does pretty well. But again, there's a huge individual variation in this kind of behavior. And generally, this uh, early pressing um, is considered to be the main index of impulsivity. Well, um, here's two examples. This is the one you've seen before. This is one who, who can't do it and, and keeps pressing uh, immediately. Um, this is not related to normal aggressive behavior, no correlation whatsoever. So that, that gives us another, in my view, another dimension in this uh, multidimensional personality uh, scale, so to say. It gives us a dimension of behavioral inhibition impulsivity. And we would predict that an animal that's proactive, anti-impulsive, and maybe uh, high or low emotional, that that's the violent individual. That was the prediction. And indeed, the, the work by Carolyn Coppens uh, uh, showed that that's indeed the case, which now express this efficiency. Indeed, these, these violent males, they, they are the highly impulsive animals, so the proactive, highly impulsive animals. All right, um, so what, what I basically did is I almost decomposed the violent phenotype in a number of characteristics. It's proactive, it's rigid. Um, we have done some, we have, some evidence that they have a low emotionality. Um, I have no time to go into that. Uh, reward dependent, low social bonding, I will show that later on, and they are impulsive. Well, let's, let's change gears now and go to neurobiology. Because this, this predicts that these, uh, there, there will be an individual differentiation in the underlying neurobiological mechanisms. And I would say that each of them will have a different kind of neurobiological substrate. What I will do is um, show a bit about uh, this component and um, um, later on the uh, uh, this on oxytocin. All right, let's, let's go to the brain. Well, this is more or less the, what I would call the social behavior network. It includes the... Um, uh, hypothalamic attack area, amygdala area, uh, prefrontal cortex, lateral septum, periaqueductal gray, you name it. What I would like to focus on is um, the serotonergic innovation of this neuronal network. And the reason, it, it's innovated by the dorsal medial raphe nuclei, and the reason for this is that the 
idea that serotonin somehow is involved in aggressive behavior is, is very ancient already. It's a very long history. And this history goes back to um, work by Gerald Brown and Frederick Goodwin. Um, and that's the basis of what they call the serotonin deficiency hypothesis. They measured serotonin in the cerebrospinal fluid of American Marines who were dismissed from the Marine because of high aggression scores. And I have the idea that if you are dismissed from the American Marine because of high aggression scores, it'll be violence. Uh, uh, uh. So you've had this highly significant neg negative correlation. We tried for many years to replicate this phenomenon in, in a rat and a mouse model. And for many years we failed. Um, this is what happens in the untrained normal aggressive behavior. We measure serotonin in the prefrontal cortex in this case, no correlation whatsoever. The same holds if you have the trained, highly aggressive males. Again, it's the blue, blue dots, no correlation whatsoever. But you do find the correlation if you only look at these violent type of individuals. Then you find a highly negative correlation, which indicates that there is something wrong, basically, in the feedback control of the uh, serotonergic system, particularly in these animals. And this shows also that you have to really dissociate normal behavior from its pathological forms. All right, so the idea is that, well, we, we investigate this by focusing on the feedback control, the intrinsic feedback control of the 5-HT neuron. Now here you have the dorsal raphe with the 5-HT neuron, and there are basically three main mechanisms that are involved in the negative feedback control. That's the presynaptic uh, 1B receptor, it's an autoreceptor that um, inhibits the, the release at the synaptic terminal. It's the serotonin transporter that takes up the release serotonin. And it's the 5-HT1A autoreceptor, which is a somatodendritic receptor that um, inhibits its own activity, basically. Well, if, if you want to study this, you have to have the right tools. And fortunately, we have the, a perfect tool for this, and this is called S15535. It's a Servier compound that is an agonist specifically at this site. It sounds wonderful, um, but I'll show you some evidence that, that that's really the case. It's uh, developed by, uh, by uh, Mark Millen. He's done uh, lots of uh, tons of work on this. Um, but this is some of the evidence that it's a good tool to study the involvement of this negative feedback control. If you do, you can do microdialysis uh, at the level of the prefrontal cortex or of the hippocampus and inject these animals with this compound. What you see then is a dose-dependent decrease in the release of serotonin at the level of the prefrontal cortex or the synaptic terminal, basically. This release depends on, is indeed a 1A, because if you uh, inject before a 1A, a selective 1A antagonist, receptor antagonist, this uh, blockage is, is, uh, uh, is not there anymore. If you record from the dorsal raphe nucleus, and indeed with the peripheral injection of this compound, the raphe, the serotonin cell, really uh, is, is silent. So it's a nice tool to study specifically the role of this negative feedback control. Now, if we do, we do those, de those response curves, um, then it appears that um, there's a nice dose-dependent reduction in aggressive behavior. But if you look at the um, sensitivity of this response, then the dose response shifts to, to the left the more aggressive you are. This is, a, sorry, a bit a fake kind of graph, 
But anyway, this is the highly aggressive uh, animal, group of animals, and this res those response, response curve is shifted to the left, which means that you need much less of this compound to get a reduction in aggressive behavior. You can also express it in this way, in ED50, an effective dose 50, which means what is the dose to reduce aggressive behavior by 50%. And then you see you, you need almost a tenfold higher dose in the non-aggressive animals to reduce aggressive behavior by 50% than in the high aggressive males. Well, you might say there is a big baseline difference anyway, um, but you can measure it in, in another way. You can measure the microdialysis. Indeed, the, with the same dose, with a one single dose of SS14535, you get a nice uh, reduction in the release of serotonin uh, at the level of prefrontal cortex and also of the metabolite, indicating that these aggressive males have a highly sensitive uh, autoreceptor. Now, it appears that these violent males, they have a super sensitive autoreceptor. This is, again, on the basis of the reduction on offensive aggression. Um, it's the trained violent animal that um, has a very sensitive autoreceptor. If you take an other readout, non-behavioral readout, and that's the, I don't have time to go into that, but the stress-induced hypothermia, which also depends on this autoreceptor control. Again, it's the, the violent animal that shows this receptor supersensitivity. So, to summarize, aggressive behavior is positively associated with an enhanced negative feedback control of the serotonin neuron via its 1A autoreceptor, and we can demonstrate it for the 1B as well. And violence is characterized by supersensitivity of this particular receptor. Now, there, there is a problem, and I don't know whether you notice this, but it's usually you, 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 you can skip it. But I think it's important to notice that there is a, a, a strong paradox in all this. It's called the serotonin, uh, aggression serotonin paradox. Because aggression and violence is characterized by low levels of prefrontal cortex serotonin. Now, if I use these compounds, I showed you serotonin is even further reduced. This lowering serotonin by activating the inhibitory control uh, further reduces aggression rather than increasing aggression, which you would predict from low, even lower levels of serotonin. Well, there is a solution to this paradox. And uh, the hypothesis is that we should consider this low serotonin, this strong inhibition, as, as a trait characteristic. It, it's intrinsic to, to this type of uh, uh, animal. But you may wonder what happens during the aggressive act itself. And it's likely that during the aggressive act itself, so it's a state kind of condition. Serotonin is suddenly released from a strong negative feedback. And if you use these compounds, of course, you block this sudden release as well. You, you can't do it. So that's why you, you find a reduction in aggressive behavior. But it predicts that during the aggressive act itself, this dorsal raphe nucleus is active. It's, you get a release of serotonin. Well, we tried to, to demonstrate that, and so that's a difficult job. But we decided to, um, to do the CFOS staining of the raphe nuclei and combine it with the serotonin staining. And you see this, uh, this is an example of, uh, of this combined staining. Well, indeed, if you measure, and the, the important one, of course, is the combined activation, the combined staining, of serotonin and CFOS, then indeed in these um, highly aggressive males there is a significant higher level of activation in the dorsal raphe in particular um, compared to the non-aggressive males and compared to an animal that has not uh, been involved in a fight. And uh, these stainings were done half an hour after the uh, animals were engaged in a fight. So. Um, this is our conclusion that the enhanced supersensitive autoreceptor feedback should be considered as a trait characteristic. 
and the initiation and expression of aggression and violent acts it, itself associated with an increased dorsal raphe activity that may be very short-lasting. That's why you, it's very hard to, to detect it. Um, uh, and, and it immediately gets shut down again. So I, I would like to change to one other uh, aspect, and that's oxytocin. And the main reason is that um, oxytocin is, is throughout the life cycle involved in social behavior. It's involved in um, uh, uterus uh, giving birth. Um, it, it's in childhood. It's involved in play behavior. And at adulthood, it's involved in mate choice. Uh, it's involved in aggressive behavior, sexual behavior, social behavior. The reason to go into this is that recently uh, there are some ideas that um, antisocial personality disorder, again, rather violent and predictive uh, individuals, are characterized by a low oxytocinergic signaling in the brain. That's a, a human kind of stuff, uh, data. Um, so we decided to, to go into this uh, um, uh, issue, and oxytocin indeed uh, is Receptors are present here at the level of the raphe, but also present at the level of the amygdala, uh, for example. So there is all sorts of reasons to suggest that oxytocin may play a role in all this. Um, well, we, were the, we are now the first who, to demonstrate that indeed oxytocin is involved in uh, territorial aggressive behavior. If you infuse uh, ICV um, oxytocin, then you get a nice uh, reduction in, um, in a offensive aggressive behavior. Uh, if you use the receptor antagonist, you've had uh, some of them increase, but it's not, not significant. These animals become more social. They spend a lot more time under the influence of oxytocin in social explorative behavior, uh, not only towards the intruder male, but also towards their female. Surprisingly, this is the period of infusion. One week later, this is still uh, maintained, something we, we were really surprised by but don't know why this is. But again, the question is, is there any variation, individual variation in all this? And I have a somewhat uh, complex slide. It's a recent work by uh, Federica Calcagnoli in our lab. This is uh, uh, the aggression uh, scale this is a positive one, so you find increase, and this is a negative side of the scale to decrease. If you inject oxytocin, you find this kind of correlation related to the baseline aggressive behavior of the individual, which means, again, that the, the more aggressive you are, the, 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 the stronger the reduction. If you use the antagonist, then um, the less aggressive you are, the non-aggressive reactive type of individual, they respond with an increase in, in aggressive behavior using the receptor antagonist. Now, in collaboration with uh, Inge Neumann, Regensburg, who was here yesterday uh, or the day before, we analyzed this any further and asked the question whether these violent animals really you can distinguish these violent animals in this kind of uh, oxytocin-mediated processes. Well, yes, you can. If you measure mRNA, you find in the vi only in the violent animals um, a lower uh, mRNA expression, in particular in the periventricular nucleus, not in the superoptic nucleus, indicating uh, this is the parvocellular region indicating indeed that these animals produce less oxytocin uh, as, a, as a neuropeptide. Now, what about the receptor side? If you do the receptor binding, then again, it's only in the violent animals you find an increase in the bat nucleus, but in particular in the central amygdala, in the violent males. No effects, no difference, so to seem, between a non-aggressive and a highly aggressive uh, individual. So it's again the violence that seems to dissociate at the level of the mRNA and at the level of the receptor. 
So the conclusion is that the final, the final phenotype is characterized by a reduced oxytocinergic signaling, and the individual variation in oxytocin may reflect variation in, in sociality. This, I'm come to my end. Uh, I have a few take-home messages, more general take-home messages from these presentations. In my view, animal models of psychopathology should be based on the clear dissociation of pathology from its adaptive counterpart. Well, this seems almost self-evident, but it's, it's, not, it's not that easy to, to really say when is a behavioral change adaptive, and when is it maladaptive? Um, and in my view, there is a, a, a strong interpretation bias towards biomedical interpretations in many animal models, including many of the depression models, not considering the possibility that um, a change might be a highly adaptive kind of change. And in my view, indeed, violence should be considered as the pathology of biological and functional aggression. Um, and also pathology is likely to occur in only a small proportion of the total population, human and rat population, and the, the majority is resilient. And I really would like to emphasize the idea that you have to start with, with large groups of animals to really select animals that are uh, vulnerable to a kind of uh, uh, disease. Um, so this selection, in my view, of a vulnerable phenotype requires characterization of a large number of animals. Our violence work is based on 150 um, aggressive animals, and only 7% of this population shows the violent uh, phenotype. And finally, I would say the biology and ecology of the species should be the reference point for the design and interpretation experiments. That's why we went to our wild type rat. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge, in particular, um, my uh, collaborators at the lab, and in particular, Sitz de Boer. He has been very instrumental in, in, in a lot of the, the work I, I've demonstrated to you. Um, a, a number of uh, PhD students who have been uh, heavily involved recently in this kind of work. Inge Neumann with uh, uh, all the oxytocin work, and we have a long-standing collaboration with Joseph Haller on the uh, pathology as well. Uh, and I would like to uh, end up there. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. That was a, a great talk on aggression um, and its complexities. We have plenty of time for questions if anyone has any. Yes. Um, yes, it, 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 it's, it's really an important uh, issue. Um, all these behaviors, you can easily select for it. That's, that's absolutely no problem. So there is, in, in general, with, with almost any kind of behavior, there's an heredity of, of about uh, 0.5 or something like that. Uh, so we, we do have genetic selection lines for high and low aggressive uh, um, behavior in mice, for example. Um, it, these, the high aggressive mice actually are truly violent mice, uh, for example. Um, but we haven't been able really to, to modulate um, aggressive behavior, and we haven't studied violence actually, by early life manipulations. Um, it, it's, it's very hard to, to do that. Uh, in particular, in, in the mouse, uh, strains, you, you can do whatever you want, but these genes are so dominant, basically, that um, you, you won't change them. No, no way. So um, it, it, it is important, but I don't have a true answer to this. I'm sorry, yeah. Any other questions?
We've, we've done uh, some work. Uh, if, if you go to vasopressin, uh, indeed, again, there is a strong difference in, uh, in particular lateral septal vasopressin innovation, um, which, which interestingly, by the way, is, uh, is known as the uh, sexual dimorphic um, uh, vasopressin system. Um, but I dare to say that within the male gender, this individual variation in vasopressin is just as large as between the genders. Um, yes, there, there is a, a, a large uh, body of literature on, on vasopressin, um, manipulating vasopressin. Um, we haven't done a lot on, on, on all this, um, but you can affect um, uh, aggressive behavior by local infusions of uh, vasopressin uh, agonists and antagonists. What I don't know is um, whether the, the violent animal um, differs from, from the others. Um, so th this, as you can imagine, uh, the, the study of the violence, because of the low incidence of violence, um, is, is really difficult. And you really have to be very selective what you do what you don't with the few violent animals you have. So uh, in terms of violence, I can't answer your, uh, your question. Yeah. Yes, Henry. And, um, do you conceive of uh, those violent animals or organisms that they are a quantitative difference, they're an extreme on a quantitative continuum, or are they a qualitative uh, difference? I have this, uh, gradually getting the feeling that they are on a qualitative difference. And it's, it's due to the, to the combination between these individual characteristics. Um, when, let's say, a reduced prefrontal cortex functioning impulsivity kicks in, then, then you get the violence. Um, as I said, the, these highly aggressive males are, but normal aggressive males they, that play the aggression according to the rules, um, they, they, they are fine, and you don't see any difference, uh, in, certainly not in the oxytocin, uh, but in, in the, the uh, serotonin feedback, there is a little difference, but it's nothing compared to the super sensitivity in the, in the violent animal. So I consider it as a, as a qualitative kind of difference. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the oxytocin. And I, th I was thinking about the similarity between oxytocin and vasopressin and how there's a... a relationship between vasopressin and serotonin. Yep. So I was wondering, um, are there multiple sites at which oxytocin is having its effect, and are any of those places the effect associated with serotonergic activity as well? Yep, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. We, um, we did this kind of experiment. Um, so we did the local infusions. If you infuse oxytocin at the level of dorsal rafe, you don't see any effects on aggressive behavior. Uh, whereas if at the same cannula you infuse your certain as compounds, you do find. So the location is, is correct. Um, if you infuse it at the level of the central amygdala, you do see strong effects. Uh, again, a reduction in, in aggressive behavior. So it, it's location specific indeed. Yep, certainly. Oh, another question? Have you looked at testosterone levels in the animals and if there's a difference between violent versus aggressive animals in testosterone? No. It's a, it's a long time ago that we did some work on, on testosterone. Um, there is no difference in, in – well, that was before the time we characterized the violent kind of individuals. But if you look at normal aggressive behavior, there is hardly any difference in baseline testosterone there is a difference in the pulsatile secretion. So the baseline levels are more or less the same, but the highly aggressive males have some higher pulses and some more pulses as well. Yeah, but I can't, well, as I said, the, the violent work is, is pretty new, and we haven't considered that yet. Yeah. It's a great talk, thank you. And I really appreciate what you're saying about immobility being adaptive in certain circumstances and how the force swim test doesn't really get into what 
you know, as a measure of depression. But do you see immobility as a pathological form of the reactive coping style? And if so, do you have any ideas about better ways, um, more relevant ways to assess that immobility in certain contexts? I, I, I think that um, this kind of immobility is a perfect adaptive response. It's, uh, it's, it's fine. Um, if, if you really um, objectively measure success of a kind of coping strategy and success in this case of avoiding uh, contact with this probe, it's perfect, uh, absolutely no problem. So um, you have to, to come up with additional kind of data. Um, and, and we did that um, in some of our adolescent studies, uh, like Bauke Bewalda showed uh, a few days ago, that you have to see whether this kind of immobility um, generalizes over context. For example, if you are immobile after such an experience in the presence of a female or when you are thirsty or whatever, then you get an indication that it might be maladaptive what you're doing. Um, but so far, um, most of the indications are that it's perfectly fine and adaptive what, what they're doing. I don't think there are that many really, truly pathology models. Yeah. And we have time for one more question, Trevor. So I was really struck with the beautiful data you had with the 5-HT1A agonist, yeah. completely inhibiting violent behavior. Yeah. But do you think the impact of that agent is really expressed in terms of serotonin to the prefrontal cortex? No. Or could it be... You know, some of the other serotonergic termination areas? It, it, I'm pretty sure it, it'll be some of the other terminal areas as well. Um, it, it's because we measured it in the prefrontal cortex. Um, but I think if, if you, you reduce your activity at level of dorsorafe, it will affect all, all terminal areas uh, usually. So what the, uh, the real place of action is, uh, I'm not, not sure, but um, I think it, its main function is that, um, um, that, that serotonin, um, if, if it's enhanced, you, you're open to environmental input. Uh, I think that's, that's the main function. That's why I think that um, this coping style in terms of flexibility, Q dependency, I would call it, that's a, that's a serotonin uh, axis. And we do have some evidence for that because if you start manipulating this um, autoreceptor feedback, it, it normalizes coping style. That's the surprising thing. Um, so I, I have a strong feeling that that's, uh, uh, the, the, the main function of serotonin is this um, filtering uh, environmental input or sensory input, basically. Thank you, Jeb, and yep. thank you for a great talk and a well-presented set of data, and I never realized pigs could be so much fun to work with. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, yeah, yeah. thank you.